Uh, I'd first like to address something my colleague, my honourable colleague from Dartmouth, uh, Cole Harbour, said, and, and something that I, I believed was mistaken about what he said about the people of Atlantic Canada and this government. And I'd like to correct that, and that is that this government values our great Canadians from Atlantic Canada, uh, Mr. Speaker. Well, I served in the Canadian Armed Forces. I served with many great people from this region, and to a man and a woman, they were hardworking, brave, honest, patriotic, no better Canadians, and I stand, Mr. Speaker, for these great people of Atlantic Canada. And I'd like to point out, Mr. Speaker, that we have also created 920,000 new jobs since, uh, since the recession, and most of those are full-time. Now, I'm pleased to have this opportunity to respond to this motion from my honourable colleague from Charlottesburg, Haute St. Charles. A lot has been said about our government's employment insurance changes, and it's hard to see much that is actually accurate with the intentionally misleading and over-exaggerated claims of the opposition parties. And my response, therefore, will focus on setting the record straight and drawing your attention, Mr. Speaker, to the difference between the myths and the facts about our changes uh, our government has made to EI. Now, the Honourable Member alleges that EI changes have been harmful rather than necessary and that it has either put EI out of reach of hard-working Canadians or has created undue financial hardship for many. Well, Mr. Speaker, these are myths which are simply not based in evidence. And yet, these stories continue to spread without a shred of fact. I can see why the opposition are attempting to use the politics of fear in a desperate attempt to win public support. And I might say it's also misguided. Clearly, they no longer hold themselves to the high standards they professed in the last election. So I'd like to bust a few of their myths, Mr. Speaker. Job creation, economic growth, and long-term prosperity for all Canadians. Those are our government's top priorities. We need everybody's skills and talents at work in our nation. There are skills and labour shortages across the country from most rural parts of our great nation to the downtown urban cores. Now, does the opposition motion attempt to address this most pressing of economic challenges? Does this motion increase Canada's chances of growth and long-term prosperity? And, and, you know, Mr. Speaker, the answer is, is decidedly no. Instead, it feeds into five big myths about EI, and I'm going to address each one of those right now. Now, myth number one is do EI changes mean people are going to lose their benefits, Mr. Speaker? This is, this is categorically false. No one who makes a reasonable effort to look for and accept a suitable job will be cut off of EI. Mr. Speaker, the purpose of EI has always been and will continue to be to provide temporary income support while someone is looking for another job. Regarding the requirement for claimants of EI regular and fishing benefits to look for work while collecting benefits, this is not new, Mr. Speaker. What is, however, new is that the Government of Canada has put forward a series of measures to help unemployed Canadians transition back into the labour force more quickly. And whether a claimant lives in a big city or a small community, they now have access to information on locally available jobs. And as we uh, pointed out by the Honourable Parliamentary Secretary earlier, it's www.workingincanada.ca. Some of the members were not familiar with that website today, and, and uh, hopefully you now are and will be able to access that and, and provide that information to uh, your constituents, and I hope you do. Now, we've also clarified what a claimant's responsibilities are while collecting EI. This was done through the new regulations that came into effect in early January, and these definitions explain what constitutes suitable work in a reasonable job search. Now, Mr. Speaker, the fact is that EI will always be there for people who need it. All that's expected is what all hardworking Canadians expect of themselves, Mr. Speaker, and that's to do their best to find a job. Now, myth number two, do EI changes mean seasonal industries lose, risk losing their trained workforce? Well, again, Mr. Speaker, that's false. If a seasonal business is a good employer, one that pays their workers a fair wage, there is no reason why their employees would not return to their jobs when the season resumes. Now, let's also be clear. EI is not meant as an income supplement for those who choose not to look for work during the off-season, especially when work is available in their local area. Seasonal workers, like any other type of workers, are required to look for work when receiving EI, but there's nothing in these changes that prevents someone from returning to a previous employer should they cho choose to do so once a new season starts. Now, the intent of the updated regulations is to help claimants transition back into the workforce by clearly stating how to look for suitable employment and when to broaden their search. Excuse me. We are making sure that Canadians are always better off working than not. That is why, Mr. Speaker, these regulations ensure that suitable employment consists of opportunities that would result 
in a claimant being better off financially than by working or receiving only EI benefits? And what about the status of the extended EI benefits pilot project and its effect on seasonal work? Well, the NDP are specifically calling for a renewal today of the extra five weeks pilot, pro uh, pro excuse me, pilot uh, project in their motion. Now, this pilot project was a temporary measure, Mr. Speaker. It was aimed at providing five weeks of extra EI benefits to Canadians that were hardest hit during the worst years of the recession. The program was never meant to be permanent. It was introduced nationally by our government in 2008 and then subsequently renewed in 2010 as part of our economic action plan, which, of course, has helped raise 920,000 new jobs since the recession. Now, Mr. Speaker, Canada is in a period of economic recovery. And temporary supports like the extra five weeks pilot project were allowed to end because the improvements, uh, because of rather the improvements we've seen in our economy. And now, now to myth number three, Mr. Speaker. Do EI changes mean having to accept work even when there's more than an hour commute or a drive up to 100 kilometers? It's a question that's often asked. Well, that's false, Mr. Speaker. The common sense changes we made are helping more Canadians to find a job as quickly as possible. And the fact is, Mr. Speaker, there are skills and labor shortages in many parts of the country, including areas of high unemployment. And our efforts are meant to help those out there to find the jobs, the available jobs, in their geographic areas and their areas of expertise. And again, the workinginCanada.ca website is going to go a long way to assisting them in doing that. Now, commuting time is only one element that makes a job suitable. Other factors take into account are personal circumstances, working conditions, the type of work, as well as the wages and the hours of work. <coughs> of course, common sense are always, it will always prevail, Mr. Speaker, and no one will be forced to take a job that's going to result in higher living costs and thus being financially worse off than they would be on EI. While one hour is generally accepted as an appropriate commuting time, commuting time can be longer only in two very specific circumstances. And uh, if you have a pattern of traveling more than one hour in the past, that's quite possible. You may be used to that sort of thing. Or if you live in a community where it is not uncommon to travel such distances, such as large metropolitan areas. And let me be clear, the requirement regarding the commute refers to the time it takes to go from a claimant's home to the place of work, not to drive 100 kilometers. Again, you know, the time it takes to go from the claimant's home to a place of work, not to drive 100 kilometers. I cannot stress enough times that personal circumstances will always be taken into consideration. There's a lot of flexibility and common sense built into this plan, Mr. Speaker. Now, myth number four, do EI changes mean someone will be made worse off by accepting low-paying jobs? Again, Mr. Speaker, false. And here's the facts. We are helping EI claimants get back into the job market and not to penalize them. And furthermore, the changes ensure that claimants accepting suitable employment will be better off working than receiving only EI. And as I've explained in my remarks, our changes are guided by common sense. There's a lot of flexibility. We will, of course, take into account the claimant's personal circumstances into consideration to determine whether a particular job is suitable or not. Now, if a claimant lives where there are a few jobs available, there are still activities they can do to look for work, Mr. Speaker. Simply saying that there is no work and not looking for work is not acceptable. At a minimum, those living in regions with limited employment opportunities can talk with former co-workers, friends, and other community resources about job openings. And that networking option is, is something people generally do as a, as, a, as a standard operating procedure when looking for a job. And they can also look in a newspaper online for potential jobs. And again, they can also use the enhanced job alerts for up-to-date information up to twice daily on jobs available in the area. And the website, again, is www.workingincanada.ca. Should someone be compelled to accept a job that would leave them worse off financially and being on, on EI? Well, no, Mr. Speaker, that's, that's not going to happen. EI is there to help people, to support them while they're looking for a new job. Now, myth number five. Do EI changes mean that there are new obligations for claimants? Well, once again, Mr. Speaker, false. Much has been made of claimants and benefits being obligated to search for suitable work. Now let's look at the facts. These claimants have always been required to conduct a reasonable job search and accept any offer of suitable employment. That's not new. Uh, the changes are about making those responsibilities clear 
for claimants. So regulations have been updated and now there is a clear understanding of what constitutes suitable employment and a reasonable job search. So let's set the record straight, Mr. Speaker. The updated rules defining what constitutes suitable employment are based on the following. Based on commuting time, they're based on working conditions, uh, the type of work, the compensation, the hours of work, and the claimant's personal situation. The type of work and compensation that a claimant will have to seek will vary based on his or her contribution to and, and use of the EI program and time spent on the claim. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in the face of groundless fear-mongering as witnessed in this motion, I've laid out the facts and the changes our government has made to EI. And what we're doing with these changes to help move Canada in the right direction, to continue on a path of success and prosperity for all. And that is the absolute goal, Mr. Speaker. Success and prosperity for all. And that's where the 920,000 new jobs, mostly full-time, have been created, Mr. Speaker, because this government remains focused on jobs and the economy, and Canadians are benefiting from that focus. Now, it's a fact, Mr. Speaker, job creation and economic growth for every single Canadian looking for a job continues to be the number one priority of this government, as I've said, and we're proud of the fact of the 920,000 new jobs. This is a G7 leading job growth, and because of the strong economic leadership of our Prime Minister and our Minister of Finance, who I uh, believe is now the longest serving finance minister in the G7, and in fact, the best. You know, our economic action plan is working and has shown tremendous results. Mr. Speaker, you don't have to listen to me. You can, you can look at the world bodies. You could look at expert uh, organizations like the IMF and others around the world who laud Canada for its approach, who laud Canada for its successes, and who other countries are now modeling themselves upon Canada for because of our success in growing our economy and growing our jobs and making sure that success and prosperity is, is equally distributed to all Canadians. And we, we continue on that mission, Mr. Speaker, because it's important to do that and this is something that we as a government will remain focused on for all Canadians. Now we've provided those job seekers better tools to help them with that task and, and that means that Canadians are now better connected than ever to the jobs that are available in their local areas matching their skills. Unfortunately, the NDP continue to vote against measures that are helping Canadians by creating more jobs and economic growth. And Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister and the Minister of HRSDC have been very clear. If Canadians are unable to find work, employment insurance will be there for them, just as it always has been. We have been clear that personal circumstances will be considered when it comes to determining what a reasonable job offer is. And, and those are the facts, Mr. Speaker. Therefore, you know, I urge all members to, to vote against this ill-informed motion and, and vote against the fear-mongering. Now, I've heard today, Mr. Speaker, for example, that it is better to remain on EI than to work at Tim Hortons, for example. I, I think that's rather insulting to that particular company because uh, Tim Hortons is a venerable organization to Canadians. Many of us who travel abroad want to come home, and we look forward to that Tim Hortons coffee. I know I do. Uh, Tim Hortons has the Tim Bits hockey program. They're great to the Canadian forces deployed abroad. Um, they're a tremendous organization. It's a, it's a well-suited organization for a lot of people. And, and it does provide opportunities in, in many, many areas. And for example, what can one learn at Tim Hortons? One can learn restaurant supply systems, production, management, development, uh, retail, growth within the company. It, it's a very vibrant company. As we've heard today, the Minister of Finance said the source stores are, are expanding in Canada and providing jobs. Retail is a very vibrant, um, very vibrant uh, sector in this country. Walmart stores are coming. I, I heard somebody snicker about the Walmart stores earlier, which is just unacceptable because that also is a tremendous organization that, uh, that is uh, growing, it is providing jobs, and in fact, uh, have, have always provided jobs to seniors as well, which is, a, which is tremend uh, tremendously laudable for that company to do that. And uh, as I mentioned, McDonald's has a world-renowned management development system. People who started on that line flipping burgers 
uh, have, have uh, risen in the ranks in that company to, um, to manage uh, local stores and manage groups of stores within, uh, within that organization. So it's been a tremendous um, uh, boost to people who are just starting in their careers who may have been unskilled when they started but developed those skills uh, as they worked their way up through that company. So to, to look down on, on these sorts of jobs you know, and lots is true of the other chains, restaurants, retail jobs, uh, <coughs> pardon me, and, and all of these jobs that so many opposition benches here, you know, quote unquote, uh, deem to be beneath them. And that's, that's unfortunate, Mr. Speaker, because, you know, that speaks to the attitude of the NDP and the Liberals who, you know, it, it's, it smacks of a do as I say, not as I do kind of attitude. And, and I know that's not good enough for this government, Mr. Speaker, and this kind of misinformation and fear-mongering does no service to Canadians. You know, in my own personal experience, Mr. Speaker, I've bussed tables, I've waited on tables, I've been a short order cook, I've built cars on the factory line, I've been a Bell telephone technician, I've worked my way up in these other things, and I started in the Army, of course, worked my way up from private. So, you know, and I've driven a truck and delivered fruits and vegetables as well. There is nothing beneath anybody who wants to work. That is called the dignity of work, the pride of work, because that's what I always got out of it, Mr. Speaker. I always felt proud that I worked my own way. I didn't care how dirty my hands got. And, uh, and, and, uh, and I always found that uh, when I came home at the end of the day, at the end of the shift, at, uh, at the end of the place I was working, and I felt good about myself. I felt pride, the fact that I earned my own dollar and uh, that I contributed to the economy in my country by working. It doesn't matter what that job is. It just matter matters the kind of pride and the kind of work ethic that an individual has to seek that kind of dignity while they are working, Mr. Speaker. So I think that's, uh, that's hugely important to, to keep in mind, that, uh, that all of those things are, are there. You know, and Mr. Speaker, you know, I think the vast majority of Canadians think this way too. You know, there's a lot of characterizations going on in the opposition benches of, uh, uh, of people that are being looked down on or taking a job that's beneath them. And, and I don't think there's anything beneath anybody in this country. I think most Canadians get up every day saying, do the best job I can, going to be the best Canadian I can be, and go out there. And even if they're, they're looking for work, they're looking for work earnestly. I think the vast majority of people or there to do a good job and to contribute to this country, and that's something, right, Mr. Speaker, and and that's something that uh, that they want to uh, aspire to. And this government is going to help them do that, Mr. Speaker. And one of the ways we're going to do that is is our job search website, which again is www.workingincanada.ca. And I'm repeating that over and over because I'm hoping that it sinks in, and that the other members of this house on the opposition benches catch up with uh, those of us uh, on the governing side and provide this information to their constituents because it's hugely important that they assist them in doing that. Because in my writing, Mr. Speaker, I help my constituents do that. I've been helping uh, some of those people with, with high, uh, high uh, dropout rates, some of those young adults find jobs. I've been steering them and working with the community college and other trade schools to find opportunities for them to go in there. Uh, we've been doing some job counseling and uh, and helping develop those opportunities for people because, Mr. Speaker, it's hugely important to be able. How much would I got? One minute. It's hugely important uh, for people to be able to 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 uh, find their way in life, to find those opportunities, to find a path uh, and an interest and something that they they can be passionate about, find a job, and move on and develop themselves in life, Mr. Speaker. And I think that's something I definitely do in uh, in Etobicoke Centre, where, unfortunately. So, unfortunately, sometimes the, uh, the members of the opposition benches consider looking for those kinds of opportunities a colossal waste of time. But I'll tell you, Mr. Speaker, we don't do that on this side of the House. We believe that a Canadian who wants to find a job, a Canadian who wants to work, is a proud Canadian, a Canadian with a lot of dignity. And that's something that we're going to push for and work for. So I, I certainly hope that uh, on that side of the House that uh, many of the um, members will, will start working with their own constituents that way and take a hands-on approach to helping them find a job rather than, than spread rhetoric, fear, misunderstanding, and, uh, and, and uh, misinformation in this House, Mr. Speaker, which is something that, uh, that we don't want to do. And, Mr. Speaker, this government is never going to do what the Liberals did, and that's take billions, billions, to the tune of $57 billion 
out of the EI program. Mr. Speaker, that's absolutely staggering and absolutely unacceptable. So, Mr. Speaker, I guess I'm done. So on, uh, on that, Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. I would just remind all honourable members to, to steer all your constituents that are looking for work to www.workingincanada.ca. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.